Continuing our reading in Abraham Hannibal and the Battle for the Throne by Francis Summers Cox, Chapter 5, Uncle Mustafa, and the date is June 1704 to June 1706. And so, in the palace of the Sultan of Istanbul, the shadow of God on earth, and the ruler of the world's mightiest empire, Abraham began the strangest two years of his short life. And they were not unhappy years. There was cruelty there, but Abraham himself was kindly treated. There was a palace far bigger and more splendid than the palace of his emperor in Ethiopia, even than the palace of the sun king. And Abraham never stepped outside it till the day he left forever. A huge wall went right the way round the palace, and inside the wall it was like a little city, a city of 5,000 men, women, and children, a city of secrets inside secrets inside secrets. The courtyard that Abraham had first entered, where he saw the heap of heads of the sultan's enemies, led through another great gate, the gate of greeting, to the second courtyard, where the general public could not go full of fountains and flowers and trees, with huge stables and even huger kitchens, and the great council chamber, gleaming with gold and precious tiles. In those courtyards Abraham spent his time, for his work was to be a gardener's boy, and to keep the flowers and lawns perfect. But he could go no further, since the next gate was the gate of happiness that led to the third courtyard, where Abraham and the ordinary slaves like him were not permitted to go, except every now and then for some very special task. At the heart was the most secret place of all, the Forbidden Palace, where lived the Sultan's 300 slave girls, where only the Sultan and the black slaves of the Forbidden Palace were allowed to go. It had its own gate in a corner of the second court, guarded by 30 black slave guards. The weather-beaten Turk, who had picked Abraham from the slave market, turned out to be his new master, Mustafa, and he was a kindly man who loved his work. He directed more than 200 gardeners, and in this world of dazzling magnificence, he was one of the very few really down-to-earth, ordinary people not easily impressed. Mustafa spoke broken Arabic, and he slowly taught Abraham and the other new slaves to speak Turkish, along with all the skills of gardening. But out of all the slaves who took orders from him, he did seem to have a soft spot for Abraham. He called him Ibrahim in the Muslim manner. I had a son once called Ibrahim, like you, my only child. You look about the age he would be now. What happened to him, master? The gardener sighed and looked out toward the eastern side of the palace, below which lay the narrow stretches of water between their part of the great city and the rest. He was drowned, he answered quietly, together with my wife, his mother, not far from here, just crossing the sea from the other side of the city. There was a storm blowing, but they wanted to get home safe, then be back to me. They did not come home safe. I had a sister once who was drowned, said Abraham. Mustafa looked quickly back at him. Tell me about it, Abraham. So Abraham told Mustafa the story of his mission from the emperor of Ethiopia to the king of the Franks and how his sister Lahaya tried to go with him and was drowned in the Red Sea. He told how he and his friends were kidnapped by the raiders of the desert, about how his Turkish master Ahmet and about the shipwreck on the Goat Island, and the pirates on the Star of the Sea. And from then on, Mustafa took a special interest in him, told him stories, and listened to his. Soon he stopped being master and became Uncle Mustafa. As the months went by, Abraham became more and more used to the quiet routines of life and work in the palace. His Turkish became quite fluent, and he grew taller and stronger, stockier too, on the good palace food, but having Mustafa as an uncle caused its own problems. When the call for prayer comes, Ibrahim, you always seem to avoid praying if you can, 
And I've never seen you in the mosque, not even on a Friday. Are you not a believer? Uh, I believe, muttered Abraham, looking at his feet. But my, my prophet is Jesus Christ, not Muhammad. But we pray to the same God. Pray with me when you can, Abraham. So just to please Uncle Mustafa, Abraham began to pray more often with the others in the palace. But the words he said in his heart were always the old prayers to Mary and to his father in heaven that he had learned long ago at home in Ethiopia, though by now it was growing harder and harder to remember them. At prayer time, as Abraham recited the prayers of the Muslims, his hand would always go to his neck where his little silver cross should have been, the little silver cross he had been given when he was baptized at 40 days old in another country in another life. I'm slipping further and further away from who I really am. I wonder what they would think of me at home now, bowing and kneeling with the Muslims. It was a good thing having Mustafa on his side. One alarming thing about Abraham's job was that many of the other gardeners were not ordinary black slaves like himself, or like the boys who had come from the slave market with him. Instead, they were trainee white slave guards, doing all sorts of heavy work around the palace to harden them up before their army training, gardening, woodcutting, guarding, kitchen work, rowing boats, and so on. You know, Abraham, there are hundreds of these young fellows around the place, said Mustafa one evening after work, as he sat in a corner of the first court, smoking his water pipe. They never stay gardening long enough to learn how to do the really complicated, careful jobs that I'm teaching you boys, but my goodness, they have a very high idea of their own importance. They know they're going to be real soldiers soon, feared by everyone from the sultan downward. So if one of them gives you a cheek or whacks you with his spade, whatever you do, don't argue back. It'll always be his word against yours. You could even find yourself in hospital. No question asked. I have a friend who was taken to be made a white slave guard, said Abraham. Andrew is his name. He, he would never behave like that. Every day I look for him. It would be wonderful if he did turn up in the palace. Hey, he could be anywhere, Abraham. Uh, there are plenty of slave guards, white and black, in palaces all over the Sultan's empire. And Abraham never did see Andrew Robertson, though he never stopped keeping an eye out for him just in case. What he did see was the real grown-up white slave guards, and they did look fearsome. Some of them used to guard the fore court, and then the first court, and many more used to come to the kitchen in the second court every Friday to collect their ration in the giant food pots, swaggering through in their colored boots, long blue coats, wide baggy trousers, and huge headdresses, which swept from high above their heads right down their backs. Unlike almost all the other men, they didn't wear beards, but they had nasty long mustaches, which somehow made them look especially fierce. Nearly every one of them went about with a permanent don't get in my way sort of sneer on his face. One day, in fact, two of them walked right into Abraham as he was crouching near a rose bush that he was clipping and sent him and his clippers flying. They simply laughed and he didn't dare say a word. Mustafa had warnings about the white slave guards, too. If you ever hear them drumming on those food pots, Abraham, run for cover. It means they're not happy with something, food or wages or some decision of the sultans, and then there's no stopping them. He lowered his voice. A good few sultans have met their end at the hands of the white slave guards, you know. What does the sultan have for them, then? Mustafa shrugged his shoulders. Uh, I've sometimes asked myself that same question, Abraham. Perhaps there's some reason so old no one remembers it anymore. There's a lot of questions you could ask about this palace, and you wouldn't get any answers to any of them. That is the end of chapter 6.